When we discuss the most brutal examples of colonialism, a few cases come to mind. The British in India and South Africa, the Spanish in South America, the Japanese in East Asia, the US in the American West. But there is one country which is often ignored. In the late 19th century, this country, or at least this country's king, presided over what was in essence a slave state, a regime so brutal it resulted in the deaths of around 10 million people. And this colonial brutality is at the root of one of today's biggest humanitarian crises. That state was the Belgian Congo under Leopold II. This is off-brand history, and in this video I'll discuss how and why Leopold became the sole ruler of this colony, why its labour practices were so bad, and how this formed the foundations of the Congo's disastrous conditions since independence. For thousands of years, the Congo Basin supported a variety of different polities, ranging from highly centralised monarchies ruling over hundreds of thousands of people, to nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes living in the densest of forests. These polities were significantly destabilised by the onset of the Atlantic slave trade in the 1500s. Some 6 million African slaves were taken from West Central Africa, and the guns traded for them completely changed the power dynamics within the region. Many of these polities, however, still survive into the 19th century. But our story, in the most Eurocentric of fashions, does not begin in the Congo, it begins in Western Europe. King Leopold II was a bit of a character. While his compatriots would talk about grand palaces or fine wines or how much they hate poor people, Leopold II was interested in power. He would regularly bore people at parties by spending hours and hours talking about the economic minute that aristocrats usually felt themselves above. When he got married to Marie Henriette of Austria, a dedicated lover of all things equestrian, people around the courts of Europe joked it was a marriage between a jockey and a nun, but simply calling him a nun diminishes how ambitious Leopold II was. That ambition, however, ran into a significant hurdle. Leopold was king of Belgium. The small and democratic state, nestled between the great powers of France, Germany and Great Britain, was only a minor player in European politics. Even if he could bypass the constitutional limits to his role in politics in the small democratic state, the insignificant stature of the Belgian economy offered him few opportunities to gain power and elevate himself to the stature of his neighbours. But one chance did present itself, colonialism. After a few weeks researching in the general archives of the Indies in Seville, Leopold became convinced that establishing a colony was his route to wealth and prestige. After all, if his Dutch neighbours could have sizeable holdings in East Indies, why not Belgium? Leopold, however, was a little late to the game. Countries like Britain and France already got started, claiming vast swathes of land in Asia and Africa and leaving little for poor old Leopold. His attempts to buy Fiji or the Philippines or Formosa or half a dozen other colonies all came to nothing. But there was one piece of land which did look a little promising. The Congo. Now, why hadn't the Congo, unlike most of the world, been colonised before? The two big issues to European colonists were terrain and medicine. Much of the Congo was dense forests. Although the Congo Basin crisscrossed the interior, its sharp descent into the ocean created dangerous rapids and waterfalls which no boats could cross. And even when European explorers managed to penetrate to the interior, they found diseases like malaria and yellow fever would rapidly cut down their numbers and leave them bedridden or dead. Fortunately for him, Leopold got very lucky on both fronts. Henry Morton Stanley's exploration of the middle and upper Congo between 1976-77 revealed the full extent of the Congo Basin, showing the river and its many tributaries would provide thousands of miles of ready-built waterborne motorways which newly developed steamboats could take full advantage of, fully justifying any investment to get past the rapids at the mouth. And with discoveries of new medicines like quinine, as well as the general development of medical technologies, these diseases found in the interior of Africa were no longer so deadly to Europeans. With his new colony selected, Leopold established the International African Association in 1876. On the surface, this association was to organise humanitarian and research work in the Congo, but in reality it simply acted as a front for Leopold's colonial ambitions, with him soon becoming the director of operations and primary source of funding. Depending on who Leopold was talking to, his aims would wildly change. When talking to Americans, he would outline his goal of creating a confederacy of African republics. His president would reside in Europe under the close tutelage of civilised folk, and would soon allow free trade and capitalism to reign supreme. To Europeans, he would talk of establishing a variety of free cities, trading towns along the River Congo playing a similar role as Bremen, Hamburg and Lübeck once did. To humanitarians and philanthropists, at these river stations would suddenly become hubs for research and hospitals, or bases out of which anti-slavery activities could work. When talking to American politicians, especially southern politicians who weren't particularly happy with black people no longer being slaves, he'd emphasise the possibility of the Congo playing a similar role to Liberia, acting as a state for black Americans to return to. To the French, he'd emphasise the Belgians controlling the Congo meant Britain wouldn't. To the British, he'd emphasise that the Belgians controlling the Congo meant France wouldn't. 
and to Germans he'd emphasised that Belgian control in the Congo meant neither Britain nor France would. But despite this facade, his private correspondence and the ownership of the various groups and associations relating to the Congo made clear his real intentions. Leopold wanted a colony, and he wanted to be the one in charge. These stories of free African republics and confederated states were a lie. And as one of Leopold's subordinates bluntly wrote to Stanley, quote, There is no question of granting the slightest political power to Negroes. That would be absurd. The white men, heads of the stations, retain all the powers. End quote. These words, and the attitudes behind them, would echo far into the future. To this end, as many European explorers and representatives did during the late 19th century, Leopold mandated the signing of a variety of unequal treaties. These treaties must be as brief as possible, Leopold told his legal advisers, and in a couple of articles must grant us everything. As most of these leaders were unfamiliar with written language at all, let alone the complex legalese these treaties were written in, hundreds ended up signing away both their land and their labour for very little. For example, in 1884, the chiefs of Ngombe and Mafela agreed to cede all their land and provide labour for improving that land forever to the King of Belgium, all in return for one piece of cloth per month. The concept of giving away land to a country thousands of miles away would have been completely inconceivable to these leaders, and most undoubtedly just assumed these pieces of paper that they were asked to sign an X on simply represented treaties of friendship. Leopold was successful. By the mid-1800s he had his colony, with treaties signed and borders recognised by the major powers. Legally, he'd created the Congo Free State, a corporate state under the tutelage of the International African Association. In reality, one man, with no oversight from the Belgian Parliament, was sole controller of a territory of over 20 million people. And unsurprisingly, this relationship led to a system of colonialism which even by 19th century standards was incredibly brutal. If the Congo was to be profitable for Leopold, he needed one thing, labour, and he needed lots of it. He needed thousands of porters to transport goods and steamboats from the coastal town of Matadi around the rapids to the mouth of the river Congo to Stanleypool, a three-week trek over 300 kilometres. Transporting one steamboat alone required the labour of 3,000 porters, and he needed thousands more to carry goods around the interior. With horses and other pack animals unable to survive inland, African labourers were treated like beasts of burden. Significantly more labour was required for rubber. Unlike in other colonies, rubber in the Congo was not collected from cultivated farms. It was collected from naturally growing vines, requiring labourers to travel days into the forest to collect their state-imposed quotas. As they collected more rubber, the amount of easily collectible rubber closer to towns and villages decreased, requiring more and more labour for less and less rubber production. In addition, thousands of soldiers were required to fight in the force publique, the state's military arm, against the many insurgencies and rebellions that sprung up as the pre-colonial polities and dissatisfied workers and soldiers rebelled. In most colonies, labour conditions were, often by design, poor. Not only did land and business owners want labour for as little cost as possible, but there was a general Victorian belief that the only way Africans could become civilised was through hard work. However, in most colonies there were certain guarantees, though unevenly enforced, around wages and working conditions of African labourers. In British Kenya, for example, there was a limited legislation to regulate contracts between employers and workers, reducing the worst examples of encouraged labour where Africans would be threatened by employers or tribal chiefs to become part of the workforce. No such guarantees existed in the Belgian Congo. With no parliamentary oversight, the humanitarian and philanthropic Leopold created what was in essence a slave state. Compulsory labour was the norm, with agents of the state using violence and working with African slave traders in the region to meet the massive labour demands of the government. Under a system personally approved of by the king, white state agents were paid a bonus according to the number of men and the amount of rubber they delivered to the force publique. No questions were asked when men arrived in chains. Regularly, the subjugation and pacification efforts of the force publique would coincide with their collection of labour. These military forces ostensibly there to bring civilization and order to the Congo, in reality acting as war bands, burning down any villages they came across and taking Africans as slaves. Africans would find their families held hostage until they agreed to labour as porters or rubber collectors, receiving little or no food and no wages for their efforts, and in the full knowledge that their wives and children would be beaten and raped while imprisoned. In 1887, Tipu Tip, a powerful African slave trader who operated in the eastern Congo, was even made governor of the colony's eastern region. Once in work, conditions didn't improve. Workers were regularly put in chains. There were numerous stories of workers, chained together by the necks, all being pulled down into rivers or ravines where one of their compatriots fell during a forced march. Their overseers whirled chicot whips, the scarred backs of African labourers showing how regularly they were beaten. 
These workers were underfed and overworked, often to their deaths. One Congo State official described the porters he needed for his trek past the rapids. Quote, there were about a hundred of them, trembling and fearful before the overseer, who strove by whirling a whip. For each stocky and broad-back fellow, how many were skeletons dried up like mummies, their skin worn out, seamed with deep scars, covered with superating wounds. No matter, they were all up for the job. End quote. Death rates were especially high for porters. Of the 300 conscripted by District Commissioner Paul Le Marinel in 1891 and sent on a 600-mile force march to set up a new post, not one returned. These conditions were not due to individuals. Although Leopold attempted to argue that any stories of brutality in the Congo were either embellished, exaggerated, or due to a minority of unrepresentative administrators, in reality this brutality was systematised. Perhaps the best example of how these conditions were systemic is a section of the Manuel du Voyager et du Resident au Congo, a semi-official book given to all state agents in the colony. In one section, it is written that, quote, In Africa, taking prisoners is an easy thing to do, for if the natives hide, they will not have to go far from their village and must come to look for food in the gardens which surround it. In watching these carefully, you will be certain of capturing people after a brief delay. When you feel you have enough captives, you should choose among them an old person, preferably an old woman. Make her a present and send her to the chief to begin negotiations. The chief, wanting to see his people set free, will usually decide to send representatives. End quote. Here, in black and white, is the state telling its administrators how to use hostages to gain slave labour. The small number of white colonists in the Congo had free reign to treat the African population in whichever way they wished. Stanislas Lefranc, a devout Catholic and monarchist who became one of the few to attempt to publicise the horrors of the Congo, wrote of how in Leopoldville one morning he heard children screaming. Upon investigation, he found some 30 children, some around 7 or 8 years old, all lined up and waiting their turn to face 50 cracks of the whip. Their crime? Earlier that morning, some African children had laughed in the presence of a white man. In response, he ordered that all the servant boys in the town be gathered up and given 50 lashes. Lefranc managed to get this reduced to 25. Many used female slaves as concubines, over which they had total authority. Matthew Peltzer, the base commander at Luluaborg, had his concubine killed after she slept with another man. His punishment didn't come from the government. It came months later when troops under him rebelled and killed him for his brutality. And this leads us to perhaps the most infamous example of brutality in the Congo, the practice of cutting off hands. The origins of this practice are, in a way, so practical and mundane that they perfectly highlight how African people were dehumanised in the Belgian Congo. With significant amounts of rebellions and civil unrest, the Belgian Congo had a large standing army, regularly running sorties to put down opposition movements and collect labour. There was a fear, however, that soldiers would lie about the numbers of kills they've got, either to earn a higher bonus or, even worse, to hide away bullets to prepare for a future rebellion. The solution to this was simple. For every kill a soldier got, they must go to the body and cut off the hand, returning it to their commander for confirmation. Quickly, however, cutting off hands and feet became a general punishment inflicted on the African population. Don't meet your unreachably high rubber quota for the week. Your hand, and perhaps the hand of your wife and child, will be cut off to motivate you for next week. It was just another example of brutal practices inflicted on Africans in pursuit of profit. As a, a quick side note, I don't want you to think that other colonies represented bastions of labour rights for Africans. Often the conditions in other colonies with rubber-laden forests like the Congo were remarkably similar to those under Leopold. These profit motives and racist attitudes didn't suddenly disappear in French, German, British or Portuguese holdings. For example, the construction of a railway in the French Congo in the 1920s saw the deaths of some 20,000 forced labourers. In many ways, the only reason we put such a large focus on the brutality in the Belgian Congo is because it represented the largest amount of territory with rubber, therefore the largest amount of territory which enabled this brutality. You might be wondering why African soldiers were complicit in such a racist, brutal and dehumanising regime. After all, while all the officers and higher-ups in the Belgian Congo were European, the vast majority of the soldiers, and therefore the vast majority of the people pulling the triggers, were Africans. The testimony of one African soldier helps us understand this. As they explained to a European visitor, they preferred, quote, to be with the hunters rather than with the hunted, end quote. While conflicts and power hierarchies had always existed in the Congo, the imposition of Belgian colonialism, bringing with it immense capital and guns and racist 19th century European attitudes, brought a new form of brutality and exploitation to the region, and that brutality only intensified with the lack of any parliamentary oversight in the Congo. To the average person in the Congo, it was hardly surprising that they'd rather join the side of the oppressors than join those who were having their limbs amputated and families killed for not working hard enough. 
and this explains why many Africans were willing to work for a regime that was more than happy to enslave, torture and kill other Africans simply because of their skin colour. Of course, this doesn't mean that every African accepted Leopold's state. A number joined various mutinies or rebellions that sprang up during the colonial era. One such movement was established in the northeast of the country in 1897 under the leadership of Malamba. 3,000 soldiers and as many porters and auxiliaries mutinied during a long forced march towards the rhythm River Nile. Over three years and 600 miles, the rebels fought against loyalist force public forces along the eastern border, fighting beneath a red and white flag in a multi ethnic force and inflicting serious damage to Leopold's state. In April 1987, these insurgents captured a French priest, Father Augustine Achte, having heard stories about barbarous Africans he feared for his life. Instead, however, they slaughtered a goat to feed him and brewed him a cup of coffee. They told him he was spared, according to Achte, because I had no rifle, I taught God's word, I took care of sick natives, and, the decisive argument, I never hit a black. They had no qualms with Achte or white people in general, they only took issue with the Belgians who had treated them so poorly, telling stories of one officer who shot 60 soldiers in one day because they refused to work on a Sunday, and others who poured salt and pepper in Chicot wounds. They spoke of their desire to set up an independent state free of white rule. Before sending him away, they gave Achte ivory to compensate for the goods confiscated from him. Apparently, so that you won't write in Europe that we stole from you. Sadly, these rebel movements were unable to successfully end Leopold's tyranny in the Congo, the power of European guns and capital being too much. At best, as happened with the movement above, they could hope to fight to the borders and find a home in a neighbouring colonial state with less brutal government. Um, you, you probably noticed that I didn't use any images for this section. This is because after an admittedly short search, I couldn't find any of this particular rebellion, or any other rebellion movement in Leopold's Congo. As most of these movements failed or faded away, they didn't receive the sort of bombastic memorials that the colonial conquest did. They've only survived through scant accounts of the small number of sympathetic Europeans and oral histories. One common counter-argument to criticisms of colonialism is that European colonialism in the 19th century led to development. It doesn't matter that millions of people in the colonial world died as a direct result of the policies promoted and enabled by European colonial powers, these arguments posit, because those same colonial powers built schools and railways. In practice, this argument falls apart. I'm sure, for example, that Indians aren't particularly thrilled when Britain built railways to facilitate the export of foodstuffs, directly contributing to millions of people dying in preventable famines in the 19th and 20th centuries. And even by those incredibly low standards, Leopold did an awful job at developing the Congo. In 1890, for example, Leopold mandated the creation of three children's colonies, ostensibly for education of orphan children. Of course, knowing Leopold, his intentions were anything but humane. In practice, these colonies were filled with children of Africans killed during the raids by the force publique, returned in chains after lengthy forced marches. The death rate in these colonies was immense, often over 50%. Thousands of children died on forced marches or directly afterwards. Of 108 boys sent on a forced march to Boma in 1892-93, only 62 made it to their destination, with a further 8 dying in the following week. Those fortunate enough to survive would spend the rest of their youth ruled by the Chicot in the chain, with boys trained solely with the goal of turning them into soldiers. These were the only state-funded schools for Africans in Leopold's Congo. Even the infrastructure ostensibly for the development and improvement of Africans was, in reality, simply another method to oppress them. So far we've spoken primarily about different examples of brutality and exploitation in the Congo, but what does it look like when we try to quantify it? Putting a number on the deaths under Leopold in the Congo is incredibly difficult. There was no census conducted in the Congo until 1924, and generally documentation from colonial officials was sparse. Therefore, historians such as Jan Vecina and Adam Hochschild have combined anthropological, ecological and oral historical sources to estimate by how much the Congolese population reduced under Leopold. They identify four factors which decreased the Congolese population. 1. Murder Thousands of Africans died after being killed by brutal administrators and soldiers, as we've already mentioned a couple of times in this video. However, due to the limited number of soldiers in the Congo, murder wasn't the biggest killer of the local population under Leopold II. 2. The starvation, exhaustion and exposure caused by people being punished by or fleeing from the state. For example, Presbyterian missionary William Shepherd estimated in 1899 that, due to state terror, within a 75 mile radius of Luebo, some 40,000 people were hiding in the forest after escaping from the clutches of the force publique. Many of these would not survive. And similar conditions could be found across the Congo. 3. Disease Much like what happened to Native Americans, millions of Africans died due to diseases brought to Africa by Europeans, allowed to spread much faster due to the Congolese being forced to travel long distances by the state. 
it's estimated that in 1901 alone, some half a million Congolese died of sleeping sickness. While these diseases weren't intentionally brought to Africa by the Belgian colonialists, the Belgian state terror considerably increased their effects. 4. Plummeting birth rate Due to this terror, many women were either unwilling or unable to have children, further decreasing the Congolese population. Jan Vecina, using a variety of different sources, concludes that the population of the Congo was cut by at least half. The 1924 census estimated that the Congolese population was 10 million. This suggests that the population in the Belgian Congo dropped by approximately 10 million due to the brutality of Leopold's colonial regime. In other words, due to the brutality of Leopold's colonial government, 10 million people who would have lived did not. Even after 1908, when the Belgian state took over administration of the Congo following the growing controversy over Leopold's governance, conditions only marginally improved for the people of the Congo. The men who were stationed chiefs under Leopold remained stationed chiefs under the Belgian government. The profit motives which encouraged them to partake in such brutal practices were still enticing, and after paying Leopold an astronomical sum to hand over the colony quietly, the Belgian government were just as motivated to keep it profitable too. The new Belgian colonial minister, for example, was a former official of a company that had used forced labour to build a railway in the east of the colony, and the head of the Senate committee which approved the new colonial budget owned shares in prominent rubber companies. While reports of forced labour significantly decreased, this was in large part because the Belgian government replaced compulsion by gun with compulsion by taxation, with Africans encouraged into the labour market through the imposition of high taxes. And despite this, forced labour was still common in the mines. Labour was often just as punishing too. When the Matadi leopoldville railway line was built between 1921 to 1931, for example, more workers died than when it was originally constructed under Leopold. In 1920, in the gold mines at Moto, the Chicot was used an average of 8 lashes per worker. Until 1948, Congolese were limited to receiving 2 years of primary education and 3 years of middle education, with a small number of cadres gaining access to technical education afterwards. This was a calculated decision by the Belgian government, attempting to prevent the growth of an educated African elite who might come to challenge Belgian rule in the period. While two universities were established in the Congo, the University of Louvanium in 1954 and the University of Elizabethville in 1956, this was a decision primarily made to stop people in the Congo seeking to attend foreign universities. By the time of independence, out of 15 million Congolese, those who had a university education numbered less than 30, and of the 5,000 management level jobs in the civil service, only three were held by Africans. What we see over 80 years of Belgian colonial rule is a period of systemic underdevelopment enabled by brutal violence. The massive wealth of the Congo, from rubber to significant mineral deposits of copper, cobalt, uranium and industrial diamonds, were used to benefit the people of Belgium and Europe. The people of the Congo were expected to provide labour, but received little remuneration. Under Leopold, they were forced to work as slaves, and under the Belgian government, they were not treated much better. Unsurprisingly, when the opportunity for independence arose in the 1960s, the people of the Congo grasped it eagerly. But in this moment, it's important to remember the words of the Belgian colonial administrator from the inception of the Congo Free State. To quote, There is no question of granting the slightest political power to Negroes. That would be absurd. The white men, the heads of stations, retain all powers. End quote. While by the 1960s the rhetoric of the colonial powers may have been different, the mindset was much the same, and in combination with the underdevelopment of the colony, this would prove to have disastrous consequences for the independence movement in the Congo. And I'll explore this in more depth in my next video. Thanks for watching. So um, yeah, this is the first video of this type I've made on YouTube, so let me know what you think in the comments, any sort of constructive criticism about the content or the audio quality or the style of video, um, I'd like to, to hear what you think. And if you have any questions relating to the topics covered in the video, then, then feel free to ask a question in the YouTube comments or on the Reddit thread that I'll probably post about this. Um, if there's enough interesting questions, I might do a Q&A video, like an informal Q&A thing about it, but um, I don't know yet. Um, admittedly, the colonial era isn't my area of expertise particularly, so we'll wait and see. There should be another video up soon about Patrice Lumumba and Congolese independence in 1960. Um, that should be up on the channel very soon, so if you enjoyed this one, feel free to um, give me a subscription and that should pop up in your inbox. Um, and I do plan on doing a lot more videos like this, so if there's any topics you'd like me to cover um, about primarily modern African history, then leave it in the comments as well. Um, thanks for watching.